And hopefully my, my dog won't start barking. She, she gets these, um, she starts feeling needy just when I cannot attend to her. So what? I'm hoping she doesn't come in. <laughs> I have two right here. They'll react if yours bark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine are right behind me, so who knows? <laughs> Get like, like a whole like worldwide <laughs> parking circle going. Hey, I'm gonna. I'll start letting people in now. Thing. <laughs> Really? Yes, my little Nepali lamp there. I saw yeah. that, yes. <laughs> so, I have a lot of Nepal artifacts around the house, yeah, of course. All right. Um, so, Vinny, shall we let them in now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'll just start letting Please you do. I have 22 people, that's right. Vinny? Yes? Please take a screenshot of all the participants uh, once everybody's, you know, when the participants are at the peak, maybe. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and um, for this uh, 34th CWS uh, webinar, Wildlife Chronicles on uh, Disease, Wildlife Health, and Conservation. Uh, before we start, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to our program, um, the Wildlife Chronicles. Let me share my screen now. Okay, so um, hello, my name is Dr. Bindu Raghun and I am principal scientist at the Center for Wildlife Studies. Uh, we are a 37 year old nonprofit wildlife research, conservation policy and education. CWS is an internationally recognized center of excellence in the arena of wildlife research in situ conservation. And uh, until 2020, host public talks on the latest topics in wildlife uh, science and conservation at our Bangalore office in India. But due to the pandemic, we have uh, you know, instead been conducting a series of webinars. Um, so for our, our webinars, we have covered a wide range of topics such as public health and zoonotic diseases, tigers and elephants, snake bites, bioacoustics, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you Wildlife Chronicles. 
If you wish to support our work, please use this QR code to donate. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Uh, a lot of conservation work needs a lot of money and uh, a lot of donors to help us get that money. So with that, I would like to introduce to you our speakers today, uh, Dr. Carrie Sizauskas, who is a veterinarian with a PhD in wildlife disease ecology. Their research focuses on the physiological, immunological, and pathological processes occurring inside hosts in response to infectious disease pressures. They are particularly interested in the if file. Carrie has worked in zoos, wildlife centers, and several field locations in Africa, and has collaborated with scientists and veterinarians around the world. In fact, it was their work on anthrax and wildlife that inspired a lot of my own ideas on disease ecology and wildlife. So I'm really, really honored to have Carrie here. Carrie has also worked in the biotechnology world as a science communicator, leading scientific writing efforts across disciplines, including molecular biology, microbiology, automation, drug development, and the social and ecological impacts of biotechnology. They're also a passionate educator and artist and work to combine their skills in educating students and the general public about important scientific issues. Carrie's amazing art is showcased on the website and I encourage all of you to visit and have a look at their amazing talent and contributions to wildlife health and conservation. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sizauskas. Uh, I also introduce you to our second speaker, Dr. Gretchen Kaufman, who is a wildlife veterinarian and One Health educator. She's a co-founder of VIEW, Veterinary Initiative for Endangered Wildlife, a nonprofit organization established in 2012, dedicated to building wildlife health capacities in countries that need it the most. Dr. Kaufman has previously worked as the Assistant Director for Global Health Education and Training at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health at Washington State University, which is where I had the great honor of meeting and interacting with her. And she's also served as director of the Tufts Center for Conservation Medicine at, at Tufts University, where she founded the Masters in Conservation Medicine program, which is a wonderful, wonderful program actually uh, helping to build uh, skills in conservation medicine uh, globally. Dr. Kaufman's mission is to promote inclusion of wildlife health and conservation efforts and to seek sustainable solutions to global health challenges through a One Health approach. She strongly defends the protection of biodiversity as key to the health of the planet and continues to pursue and support the practice of conservation medicine. Dr. Kaufman has worked extensively with Asian Elephant Health and Conservation in Nepal, and we look forward to hearing more about some of her work today. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Dr. Kaufman. So with that, uh, I would like to ask both of you one of the fundamental questions actually uh, for this webinar, which is what does a disease or health mean for wildlife? You know, we talk about health for humans and we know like, you know, when we are sick and we go to a doctor, if we have pets, they're sick, we take them to the wet, but what does wildlife, does health mean for wildlife and what happens there? Uh, Dr. Zizauskas, would you like to start? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think the issue with us, it, it depends on the scale and say the time scale that you're looking, right? So if we're if we're looking at the individual scale of an individual animal, you know, is assessing that animal's health is going to be very different than looking at say population health. You know, so if you're if you're looking at a specific animal, which we may do more in the case of say very endangered animals, you know, or if they're in a zoo and we only have a few of them, right? Assessing their health is going to look much more like looking at our own health, going to a doctor, right? Sort of examining everything that we can there. If you're looking at a population level, you know, it's much more about, hey, is the population stable over time? In terms of, you know, what, um, that stability might be different for different populations. There might be natural boom and bust cycles that you have to take account of. So you can't just look at a slice of time and say, hey, this population is healthy or not. Meaning, <clears throat> oh, we see disease or we don't, which may be okay. Or, you know, uh, the animals are reproducing, they're eating, um, there's genetic diversity. So there's, I think there's so many different aspects and it, it depends on the question you're asking and it depends on sort of the output and the outcome that you're looking for 
as well. And like I said, time also really makes a difference because if you're just looking at say one slice of time in a population that like naturally goes through boom and bust cycles because of say predator interactions, you might think, oh my God, <laughs> this population is crashing. They must be diseased. Something is happening when it's really part of the natural cycle. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's a tough question and it depends, it depends on what you're after. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was a really good summary. It is a very complicated question, and it depends on, on the context and the perspective. Um, I think uh, from a big picture, wildlife health is really important, both at the individual level and the population level. And many people work, you know, crossing over, and it's, it, it is a, a bit of a challenge. <clears throat> and most of us are working towards uh, conservation. I assume everyone's interested in conservation. So the relationship between health and population health and success of populations from a conservation perspective um, is also very important um, perspective to, to, to put into the mix. Um, <clears throat> so, so there are, you know, parasites, for example, in wildlife is a normal occurrence. <laughs> and so you wouldn't, you might find that in your dog um, and want to deworm them right away, but it's it's part of a natural cycle. Uh, so being able to recognize and understand things that are detrimental um, or that are impacting the successful population is very important from a health perspective. Um, but because our our world is so impacted by humans in every which way, and many of you probably deal with wildlife, livestock interactions and those sorts of things. They're, they're, it's hard to define what's natural and what's not natural. And it's hard to, um, to assess what impact all these stressors are having on populations that makes things that are normally natural, not natural anymore, you know, or have a greater impact. Um, so I think that one reason we're all much more concerned about it now is that there's so many impacts, external impacts on wild populations that health, and um, I, I meant to say at the beginning, it's very important to include well-being as part of the equation, health and well-being, um, <clears throat> that, that we really have to look very closely at all those external impacts and how it's affecting population um, with respect to health. Um, in the old days until re relatively recently and still now by some, um, all wildlife disease is considered natural and, and it's just not the case anymore because of these external impacts. And of course, the other, the other issues with health is in those situations where humans or other animals, livestock, um, domestic animal, other domestic animals, dogs, cats, whatever, are interacting with wildlife. Of course, the, the lines get blurred with respect to pathogens and you do have issues um, where disease is transmitted in either direction. And so it's important to understand both sides of the equation, not just one. Um, uh, and there was one more thing I was gonna mention, I can't remember now. Um, <clears throat> But, but uh, I think the more people that end up working in wildlife health, bring recognition to the importance of wildlife health, um, the more we're gonna understand about um, health across the continuum. And that's really important. Yes, I just want to say that quick, that I, I just wanna say that the, I know that, you know, obviously conservation is not always, you know, first and foremost on humans' minds when it comes to wildlife health. Um, you know, often it's, it is this like wildlife, livestock, human interaction and the zoonoses, the, the diseases that can be passed between all of them that really sort of drives a lot of our efforts from the human side, which is not necessarily a bad thing if we can get the work done in some way. But, but yeah, it's, you know, we have to admit that often you know, examining wildlife health, and that could be, you know, whether there's diseases or population sizes, say, if we're looking at predators, you know, if you look at, at a predator population as healthy for us, 
when it's way lower <laughs> in the land lands that we're looking Pretty and that's gonna that's gonna change what questions are asked and what data are collected, and you know maybe some of the conclusions too about how we think of the wildlife population. Yes, I I, I totally agree. That's really important, and I just wanted to add that perspective to that that it is it, it's incomplete to just look at those things that are transmissible that are threats to people because. There's intrinsic value in the wildlife and their own health concerns as to their very existence, um, and some of these some of these issues um, are underrecognized, completely underrecognized, because the funding naturally flows from people um, and back to people, <laughs> and we have to constantly be on the lookout to bring up uh, the the broader picture of wildlife health. Yeah, actually, you, you have uh, uh, preempted my next question, which was about, so, you know, uh, no, that's absolutely fine. I think that's great. It was, it was going to flow into this. It is like, so, you know, everybody looks at now wildlife health has become important thanks to COVID-19 and some of the other zoonotic diseases, pandemics that have occurred uh, because of the threat from, you know, diseases that jump from wildlife to humans. But what is the value of looking at wildlife disease for wildlife intrinsically, what is what do you think? Why is it important for wildlife per se uh, to look at disease and health? Uh, nothing to re related to you know transmission to humans or to livestock, but just for the wildlife themselves. Um, <laughs> no, we're going to go in any order. Um, well, just as we were as we were talking about um, threats to the population, it, you know, it's success in and of itself. And also recognizing, I think some of these external influences that in fact can be indicators of ecosystem health uh, for, for, the, for a much bigger picture of, um, <clears throat> uh, from an ecological perspective, things like, you know, if we get away from infectious diseases, things like pollution and climate change and, um, you know, shrinking habitat and habitat degradation and all these things affect health and well-being uh, very much. And those things are, are uh, really important. We're not only in, you know, have pandemics and we have climate change, we have a complete collapse in our biodiversity. And that's obviously affected by health concerns that are exacerbated by all these other things that are going on. So very important to, to recognize those uh, for what they are in their, of their own, for their own sake. I would say, I mean, it's, that's always a tough question because, you know, as like say conservation scientists, right? And people interested in wildlife health, like we, we see, ecosystems and wildlife as having intrinsic value <laughs> in and of themselves, just existing, right? But I mean, let's be honest, that can often be a tough sell, you know, for funding, for governments. And so, you know, I think, you know, that's where some of the idea of like ecosystem services and sort of trying to quantify that has come from and to show that even indirectly, you know, wildlife health, ecosystem health can also benefit humans. And so, you know, I think, it is true at the end of the day, we often like at the higher level, it always comes back to how it affects humans, right? Like whether it's, oh, if, if we keep this wildlife population healthy, then it'll bring tourists and you know economic prosperity to the area if we keep them healthy well then we get these benefits of pollination or you know insect decrease if you keep the bats healthy. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I love the idea, obviously, of like ecosystems should exist because they exist. Like humans are part of that and we shouldn't be the only thing, but yeah. yeah. So that's interesting because, you know, um, for example, I'll give the case of India. We had, uh, we people have, scientists have been warning and managers have been warning about um, diseases that could come from dogs, uh, feral dogs and domestic dogs to wild carnivores. 
But until we had a canine distemper virus epidemic uh, in the only remaining population of Asiatic clients in India, uh, nobody really bothered about it, you know. And so then suddenly when we lost 30 to 40 lions at a go to a disease which was completely preventable, um, that's when people realized, oh, yeah, I mean, this is not necessarily, uh, you know, you don't necessarily uh, need to worry about disease just when it affects humans or livestock, but it could actually have a devastating impact on, uh, you know, wildlife species. And so I think that that is true. I really was struck by something that Dr. Kaufman said was that um, there are also indicators of planetary health, right? So if, uh, for example, um, the deaths of elephants that happened in Namibia due to, you know, the algal growth in the ponds, uh, we assume that was one of the drivers, but that was an indication of something that's wrong in that ecosystem that, you know, there is an overgrowth of algae and stuff like that. So I think, uh, you know, would you like to talk some more about how, you know, how, uh, why monitoring of diseases in wildlife is not just important for wildlife per se, but also for, like you said, health and well-being and at a planetary health level too. Would you like to? Uh, yeah, I don't know what more to add. I mean, you, you captured it very well. I mean, it's all part of the picture. Uh, and when we leave gaps, uh, in which all of us have probably seen, where you were, we were talking earlier about the lack of information, there's very little data on wildlife health. Um, there's very little data on most of wildlife populations at all, in just counting animals. Um, when we have these gaps, and then we go and make policy to deal with some of these existential issues, um, you know, the consequences are innumerable, the bad consequences of just not having the knowledge um, so that we can make appropriate decisions. Um, and uh, so I, I just, I know it's all money. It comes down to money and decisions uh, on priorities. And uh, we're all in a position now where we seem like we have to advocate for everything that we believe in, uh, no matter what. And maybe that's what democracy is. But it's, um, I, I think that we can't just brush aside certain things as just being unimportant. If we don't know what's happening, we can't make the correct decisions about what to do um, with our own society. Um, and, and, and we are in the driver's seat making the decisions. So, so it's really, really important to get that information. <clears throat> That's a really great point. I really like that. Yes, we are in the driver's seat. Dr. Susanskis, would you like to? Oh, yeah, I was just, just thinking about how we, you know, prioritize getting our data, right? Like, again, it, it so often comes down to money or like, you know, directly affecting humans or our livestock. And then I think like sort of the next tier tends to be, you know, the charismatic megafauna, right? Like the, the right. big animals that we notice that we like or like cute things, right? Which is fine because they, sometimes that's fine. They can, you know, learning about them can kind of create like a research umbrella <laughs> that you learn about other things. Okay. And then, and then I think like the next priority is like, oh, when we notice, say maybe less cute things like bats dying off and we're worried about how that'll affect pollination of our crops or insect control, right? But then there's this whole swath of wildlife that we just tend to ignore because again, it's like, it's not obviously right. interacting directly with us. It's not obviously providing us a service. It's not obviously like tourist friendly. And I think those gaps are so huge because huge, huge. you know I, yeah you can only get so far by studying the elephants and the lions which is important but you know if you're not also studying you know the ground squirrels <laughs> or the parasites or the insects you know and, yeah. and there's more and more of that but it's yeah, yeah that i think our gaps are because of you know sort of where our focus goes i, I think it is encouraging that there is more of that you know, people are looking at soil health, for example, yes. with a yes. with a very strong ecosystem uh, perspective, and and that's a very good thing. And so I think that we we are moving in the right direction from the old days, <laughs> yes. but um, but there's so much to learn, so much to learn. I I actually um so that's something very interesting. I like 
I know from having worked in the Western part of the world, that that's something that really is a new direction. Even looking at AMR, antimicrobial resistance in wildlife, that's a new direction that people are taking, that's great. But unfortunately, when we come to Asia, um, especially our corner of the world, there's really very, very little that we've done, uh, even at the basic, most basic understanding of wildlife health and wildlife disease. And yeah. Um, yeah. I would love to hear your experiences with regards to that. What do you think are some of the factors that that are affecting understanding wildlife health and disease in Asia, especially? Wow. I mean, I, I yeah, I have a lifetime of experience trying to trying to break through um, in, in, in the little area that I've worked in in Nepal. Um, um, and I have done some other, other work in, in a little work in India and I certainly have colleagues, but it's no, you know, it's, it's not special. Um, many, in many countries, the, the political system is very stratified and hierarchical and the, um, the openness to information just isn't there, especially if it makes you look bad. So we we have we have a lot of problems just in our stru our structural problems in the way we manage wildlife. Uh, we have that in the United States too. You know, I, I don't know how many people understand, but for example, all of our our state wildlife departments, which usually include a veterinarian and health departments, most of that is funded through hunting licenses. Yes. And this, this is back, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, over a hundred years ago, when this idea was put in place that the people who hunt should pay, and then that could pay to preserve the populations they're hunting. Well, that bias is everything in that the only species they care about are the species that are being hunted. They're still, um, you know, it's called non-game and game, <laughs> and, and all the money goes towards. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and it influences like the predators, right? That oh, that everything, prey, every yes, on the, on the like species because hunters, and I think it's changing a bit. But hunters are like, how dare we not have enough, you know, of this to hunt? But 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 these things are ensconced in our systems. Yeah. So we have system wide. Uh, uh, or institutionalized practices that are, are a barrier to what we really need to do. And um, so what I found um, in Nepal, um, which is I think typical of many countries, is that there is no information. So when we, when we first started working there, the records on wildlife health or wildlife disease or any of that were handwritten in a book by um, um, the, the wildlife veterinarian for the country, okay? And there was one, um, I don't know if he's on the phone here, <laughs> he might be. But, but that's, that, that data, uh, was not disseminated, analyzed, not to his fault. He was a one person doing everything. Um, and uh, the people making policy and making decisions didn't necessarily have access to it or were equipped to even understand it if they did have access to it. So there's this, this whole chain of misunderstanding, lack of information and disconnect between the people on the ground and the people making policy um that perpetuates a lot of problematic um situations and and i think it's absolutely getting better um and the more you know the more people that uh, raise their voices and and contribute in a constructive way and um later on we can talk about some of the some of those things that that we did there but um we, we need to educate the people in policy making, as we do here as well, um, to, to be able to make better policy with this information, but there just is no data, there's no information, there's no funding to get the information. Um, and that all has to change, um, uh, but it's not easy, it's not easy. Yeah, that brings me to the, this point about where you were talking about how we have to make sure there are people who raise this issue, who push this issue. Right. Um, and a lot of conservationists uh, still, most, most conservationists, most ecologists, 
still don't consider wildlife disease a really important issue, big enough right. issue for them to worry about. And so right. why, why do you think they should worry about? Like, um, I think Dr. Sizowskis, would you like to, uh, yeah. you know, talk about from your experiences working with, you know, wildlife in Africa, especially, especially with the anthrax uh, scenario, why would it be important for a biologist or an ecologist or a conservationist to also worry about disease apart from all the other ecological aspects of a population, wildlife population? Yeah, I mean, I think because, you know, disease is an intrinsic part <laughs> of ecosystems. Um, and that, you know, I want to emphasize that not all disease is bad necessarily. I mean, on an individual level, right? <laughs> like if you're that animal that's sick and dying, you're going to feel like it's pretty bad. On a population level, diseases often, I mean, these populations have co-evolved with a lot of their diseases over millennia. And it's, you know, disease is really important for driving evolution, natural selection, for, you know, training the immune system, for, um, you know, population control. Um, you wouldn't want to take all diseases away. You know, I, I've worked a lot with, you know, gut parasites, which have been found to be potentially really immunomodulating, which can be really important. It can make animals more susceptible to some diseases, but maybe healthier in other ways. And so, so I think going in with that understanding that disease doesn't always have to be managed. Um, like, you know, when I working in Namibia, in Natasha National Park that has a lot of anthrax, anthrax is typically not managed there because it's a natural disease that, you know, it kills hundreds of animals a year, but say, you know, if it kills a few hundred zebras out of a population of 15,000 and it's been there since time immemorial, it seems to be pretty stable in the system. On the other hand, you know, I, I worked a bit with um, a wildlife conservation place in Zimbabwe and they had a huge anthrax outbreak, I think like back in 2005 or something. Um, and that was, a bit more unprecedented there and it killed off most of say their lesser kudu population which is an endangered species and you know was kind of running rampant it was killing pretty much every animal they had um and in that scenario they decided that they did need to address that situation that they needed to try to control it any way they could because you know, it was also spilling over into nearby farms and that's dangerous but really from like a conservation perspective it was not it was not obviously sort of well balanced in that system because of the number of animals suddenly dead that they had not seen before. And so, you know, that, yeah, like in that scenario, controlling that as much as they could, and, and that was a really tough thing. They did as much as they could to vaccinate animals and round them up in big bomas and, you know, and, and try to get rid of carcasses in all sorts of different ways to see what worked best. And, you know, so, so I think it totally depends. So like, it's the same disease, even like both in Southern Africa, it depends on the context. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Dr. Kaufman, would you like to add to that? I, I did, uh, that great examples, really great examples about the local context, and um, and that 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 really helps to remember that because you know their platitudes about this, that, and the other are very important diseases. And well, you know, what is the context? What's the relationship? What's the relationship with not just the animal you're concerned with, but everything else uh, in the system? And um, then always with limited resources. I mean, that's a given. Um, how do you prioritize these things? You have to think about, about that um, issue, about, yeah. about the context very carefully. And part of that too leads to including um, making sure that local inputs are real and, uh, and, and engaging all the time. Because certainly they're the, the, the local communities are the ones that are going to have the most uh, the most observations and also the most impact and the most invested in what's going on. So the so that's a really important area to concentrate on your education as well as up the chain to the policymakers, of course. But um, and they can actually provide that context for you to be able to um, figure out what priorities should be should be taken. Okay. Uh Dr. Sizowskis, you mentioned that, you know, um, 
how uh, anthrax was you know a part of the system in etosha and it was not really a problem until it became a problem for the kudu and so um, if people had not known that anthrax was endemic in the system it is part of uh, the system that uh, that it has evolved with um, you wouldn't have realized uh, why you would you had this anthrax you know epidemic in the kudu and stuff like that so that brings me to my question um, is it important to look at uh, you know wildlife health or to monitor for wildlife diseases when there are no apparent signs or no apparent disease or there's no die-offs or you know not too many animals are dying should we waste our resources looking for you know um, disease when we don't really see it in the population yeah oh, i should clarify that the the big um epidemic was in Zimbabwe and then in Namibia it's uh, yeah um, but but yeah I mean I've thought about that a lot right because we we do have limited resources right there's there's only so much regardless of desire right to kind of look and study everything um, yeah again I think it, it comes down to we always prioritize sort of on those tiers right where you know we tend to monitor populations for disease if they're important for humans in some way like you know we hunt them or or say you know if we if they were vulnerable populations before and now through our conservation efforts they're rebounding that's definitely a time when we tend to you know monitor for disease you know if we if we're not seeing evidence of it because you want to make sure that that population doesn't crash again um, or when you know suddenly we see some kind of brand new weird thing like say in North America what 15 20 years ago I, I lose track of time when all the crows started dying <laughs> and you know like you can't ignore that and say oh well we weren't monitoring the crow population because whatever they were fine what's happening why are so many people finding dead crows and then that leads to figuring out oh there's this new disease in the area West Nile virus um, yeah, I think it's it's hard because we do have to prioritize. And so I don't think it is practical to go out and, you know, monitor literally everything all the time. That being said, you know, we have the quote unquote virus hunters, <laughs> you know, and going out and kind of like just taking samples everywhere to see what viruses there are. Again, that's more humans like oriented, right? We want to know like, what might the next emerging thing be? It's not really wildlife oriented. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really interested in how can we expand like citizen science? And like Dr. Coffin was talking about, you know, people who have been living in these areas for thousands of years sometimes, and who know the populations and who know the ecosystems, they're gonna be most in tune with differences and changes in what's happening. Even if we're not actively monitoring a certain species, they're the ones who are gonna notice, wait, I'm seeing fewer of this kind of bird, or, you know, a bunch of us were seeing, you know, bumps and lumps <laughs> on these monkeys that we've never seen before. And so being able to get that information collected in easier ways. And I think with, you know, the internet and with, more and more things like cell phones and apps, you know, there's obviously a, a big discrepancy across the world of, you know, who has access to certain kinds of technology, but I mean, we're already using it, you know, technology for say to monitor human health in, you know, remote areas. If we can start kind of tapping into that kind of resource where, you know, we're, we're doing a lot, especially in, I know in North America, we have things like um, iNaturalist, right? Where, where you can log, on your phone, you know, like, hey, I've seen this species, I've seen this species. We don't seem to yet really have anything for, you know, I'm missing <laughs> seeing this species or I'm noticing these lesions, you know, on the birds in my backyard. Having more of that, being able to collect that kind of information at a citizen population level, I think could really help bridge that gap. Yes, um, I think it is. Yeah, I could just share with the, um, it, it is a difficult question and there are limited resources. What I found in, in the, is that um, there also is a level of baseline knowledge that it's useful to have to even recognize that change and to have 
uh, professionals and systems in place that can respond when there is an issue. Um, so uh, part of one of the things I observed or that we worked on trying to get in when we were working in Chituan National Park, you know, there's the veterinarian and the veterinary technician and they do all this health work. And then there are uh, lots of managers and biologists that are out patrolling, looking for all kinds of things, oftentimes participating in censuses. So they're, they're recognizing species, they understand them, they know where they are. But when we say, oh, well, let's, let's build you an app so you can also record health observations as part of your regular job, um, which, could, which sounds very simple, you know, there's initial resistance that, well, I'm not a doctor, I can't do that. And of course, they can be trained to observe a lame animal. They can be trained to observe lumps and bumps um, if we put the training in and the systems in place. And then it's not even that much more work to gain that kind of baseline information where you do start to pick up anomalies or, or change um, early, which is always better than when everything's dying. Um, <clears throat> to be able to respond, and then the, then the flip side is is to even have the chain of information so that the importance of what's being observed is actually responded to. So, so it, it's quite, um, quite complicated, but there's a lot more we can do with enlisting other people, people other than the veterinarian who's ultimately the, the main uh, person there um, to, to get that information. Um, the other thing is having having some basic, well, certainly a place to put the information. <laughs> That's one thing um, with VIEW we've been working on and we're um, getting close to launching a new um, updated version of a wildlife health information system where data can be input and you know then used. Uh, so part of it is access to that basic information. And then also basic capacity to do simple diagnostics um, on, on a limited basis on whatever is in, encountered, you know, so that you can get information. Um, yeah, you don't want to start from a black hole, though. I, you know, I think it is important. It's got to be balanced um, to be able to get basic information, recognize syndromic kind of uh, events that have happened and be able to respond, but enlist and enlisting a broad swath of people and getting that data. That's really, really a great model, I think. See, I, I think that we, we should think even going beyond say like wildlife park managers and rangers and things in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, because I, I do think oh, there I is a lot of, there's a lot of just intrinsic knowledge for, you know, people who've been farming or hunting in areas like they, you know, even if they're not doctors, right? Like they know what is weird and what looks strange and if an animal's off or, you know, yeah. and, and sometimes it's just giving them license to say they know. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah, like, it's like just, well, I, I'm not an official or I'm not a trained. It's like, but tell us what you see, you know, it's valuable. Yes. And more often than not, local people do want to tell you what they see, yeah. uh, especially when they figure out that, you know, you're looking at health and you're looking at disease, they want to put their information out there. Um, and like, yeah. uh, you know, Dr. Silaska said, uh, local people, so tribals who live in forests now, tribals or indigenous people who have been living with these animal populations for centuries, and have been seeing, you know, and have been hearing about these populations are great resources again to tap into in terms of uh, obvious signs of disease. I think that's a great mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I realized that we jumped into all of these big topics, but like for a lot of our young conservations and our young participants out there, what would be interesting to know is what kind of diseases like, you know, like one of the questions that I posed as a teaser was, do wild animals get sick and what kind of illnesses do they have? So I know it's a very basic question for us, but I think it's something that not a lot of uh, ecologists and conservationists really think about. Um, so would you like to expand on what kind of diseases that you've mostly seen? I, I would like to start with Dr. Kaufman because you've worked in Asian wildlife before. So what kind of illnesses or diseases have you seen that are common in Asian wildlife and that you think are important? Um, for wildlife populations? Um, well, the, 
the things that I, we really concentrated on were, were things that were crossing through wildlife, livestock, people, whatever. I, I did a lot of work with tuberculosis in elephants. And um, also we recognized a rhino with TB, it was the same kind. Um, so, so understanding the flow of organisms like that through an ecosystem or in the environment um, is, is very interesting. And I think very poorly recognized, again, back to what I was saying before, if you only, you know, you think about bovine tuberculosis only in cows, you know, of course it is a zoonotic, or, or MTB only in people <laughs> when we, you know, and then you shut the door to any kind of other research, you're missing a huge picture. It's a most fascinating organism. Yes. Um, you know, or you look at rabies and, you know, everybody's familiar with rabies. That's another hot button these are ancient diseases. I love it when the pandemics and the emerging diseases get all kinds of press and money and everything. And then there, we haven't conquered rabies. We haven't conquered TB for sure. It's still not one of the top um, top three, you know, for, for threats to humans. And, and in fact, the differences between the, the types of TB and the MTB complex are tiny. So they're, they're undoubtedly moving through all kinds of animals. We just don't have a clue. And so how can we make policy to rid the world of TB and people? And I don't wanna keep focusing on people, but um, as an example, we're making policies to protect humans, but we're ignoring all these other reservoirs where the disease is persisting. So we either learn to live with it or, or um, you know, we're gonna really miss the boat. So with the elephants um, uh, who are, are generally uh, not that susceptible to diseases, if you call it that, there are many other, more other challenges that they have, but TB is one that they contracted from people. It's very obvious the reservoir for M tuberculosis is humans. Um, and it's spilled over into elephant populations that are managed by humans. And our worry was that it was going to then spill over into wild populations and um, affect uh, the conservation aspect of that, which could be, could be bad, even though it's a chronic slow moving kind of disease, it still is a fatal, um, a fatal disease for many animals. So um, the point of control uh, that we were focusing on was at the level of those captive elephants because they were closely managed and control was possible. Um, <clears throat> but looking for, which now I think there have been papers showing that there is M tuberculosis in wild populations of elephants in India, particularly, um, you know, what do you do about that? You can't do anything about that really. So, um, that, that's one that I've had a lot of interest in. I think, People talk a lot about spillover from dogs with distemper and rabies. Uh, lots of interesting work. How important rabies is in wild species is, again, going to be context related, probably is sort of cyclical when there are outbreaks, um, but is a very interesting area of study. Distemper, I think, is, is another one that's still not that well understood in wild populations. I don't Carrie probably has some more to say on that. Um, and, is, and is challenging um, to study, you know, these mutating viruses are really hard, hard to pin down, um, but um, can be devastating. You know, the, the, the common diseases, um, that are impacted by climate and things like that, maybe pastoral and stuff like that are less often, you know, that important. Even avian influenza um, gets more complicated when you're talking about production flocks of, you know, um, chickens and, uh, and ducks and, what, and turkeys and whatnot and people. And, but how important is it in wildlife? Um, I, I, I don't know that it's that important other than monitoring where it's going um, and trying to, to keep interaction between wild birds and, and domestic birds um, to a minimum. But uh, so making those priorities, um, 
is important. What other important diseases? Uh, those are the rabies and TB are the ones I've dealt with the most. Um, but the other the other aspects that we worked a lot on is just trying to get information because we didn't know what was important. Yes, exactly. Um, so so you know even with a a die off frequently. When there's a die off and there's no resources, the people go to investigate, they look at what happened and they decide what it is. And they write that down and that's what's in the, well, no diagnostics are done. No, you know, they look at the gross clinical presentation and they make an assumption um, about what it was. And that's the end of the story. So that's, you know, we're in this information gap there uh, where things aren't necessarily thoroughly investigated and um, for lots of different reasons and oftentimes it's a resource reason. So so I don't know there may be some um, <clears throat> more you know many important diseases that we're not recognizing that's kind of yeah, I agree. kind of where I'm sorry I, I, my internet went out yeah. much for there so I missed some of it. I was, I was, huh <laughs> I was not. Second. Yeah. So I was like, oh, yeah, yep. There's TB, like all the things that I was thinking of, you just kept hitting on yeah. like oh, TB, rabies, distemper, pastorella, you know, avian influenza. Um, uh, you know, obviously things like um, chytrid fungus and then sort of the emerging fungi that are Absolutely. now just kind of, they seem to be moving everywhere, everywhere. right? And yeah. from frogs also into reptiles in some cases. And um, yeah. yeah, I think those are some obvious ones. Some of the prion diseases, I think too have, you know, even though they're, they're seemingly at lower levels than say something like TB, it, it, it definitely, you know, those are those are things that I think are on the radar. And then, yeah, like wildlife reservoirs of potentially, say, COVID. Yes. <laughs> you know, there, there's a bit of evidence now from recent studies, and obviously we're just at the edge of figuring out, like, are there going to be wildlife reservoirs? It seems like perhaps, it seems like maybe deer can, <laughs> at least in, in America, can harbor, you know, the infection. So there's, but yeah, I think, I think all the the main ones that Dr. Kaufman mentioned. And, and again, like, like you said, it's, it's interesting that so many of these things are these ancient diseases that have been around forever. Exactly. And, and yeah, it's, it is important to look at all the emerging infectious diseases because oftentimes, you know, those are, they're new, they're scary, they're often zoonotic, but most of these ancient diseases are too. Yes. <laughs> and oh, yeah, and we know so little about them. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other thing is, is, is being that the rate of change, I don't know about you care whether you feel this way, but the rate of change and of the, the occurrence of these events is just escalating. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, I mean, maybe we're better at, fine, at observing and reporting and collecting information, but it seems to me that the rate of emergence the rate of, of bizarre events, even with old diseases. Um, I mean, look at the, the whole story with the diclofenac and the vultures and then the increase in rabies. And I mean, that whole story is so fabulous. Um, these kind of events are seem to be happening more and more frequently. So being ready for that, I think is, is another thing to think about, especially for you young folks, because you know, I think that, you know, I always think that our salvation is going to be in the next generation. It sounds like I'm passing the buck, but I, you know, I really think as, as time goes on, we know more, we're more prepared, we're more enlightened, we're more passionate um, than you younger people here have so much, so much to contribute um, and in so many ways. I agree. I think that, that's, that's a great point. Yes, Dr. Smith. Oh yeah, I was just gonna add, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I would also still urge you to like, don't ignore the old diseases. Yes, right. <laughs> just because yes. like everything now is sort of, and it, it's, I mean, let's be honest, it's also easier to say publish and get funding for mm -hmm. looking at these newly emerging 
viruses and things that are moving from place to place because of a lot of like human and livestock transport, right? But that's absolutely to say like there, you know, when I started studying anthrax in the system with the rest of my team, we were, it, we went into study realizing that there's so much basic information that was still not understood about the ecology of this disease. And there's still more to do. And anthrax has been known at least since biblical times, right? And so, yeah, don't ignore the old standbys just because you're like, ah, TB, no one cares about it anymore. Yes. <laughs> you know, more people people. than anything else. <laughs> Right. And so, so yeah, I think the new hotness is always, you know, Ooh, the, like I said, the virus hunters, there's, there's value in that. I think that's important, but I think that gets so much more press yeah. than say, you know, going back and there's still so much about say soil transmitted helminths, soil transmitted gut parasites, like that I've studied mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. don't understand necessarily how a lot of the ecology of that and how animals share them. Cause a lot a lot of those parasites can be, they're generalist parasites. They can be, uh -huh. they can infect a wide variety of species, including humans. There's so much we don't know about yeah. those and how infections happen and, and what they do to hosts. And, but it's sort of like, there's this idea that, oh, we've been there, done that. We got to look for all the weird viruses, the new viruses. And that's not to say, I, I think we need to do both. And I think we're getting yes. away too much from the old standbys. Yes, I agree with you totally. And I think uh, as Dr. Kaufman mentioned that, um, and this was important, uh, I think the purpose of, one of the purposes of this webinar was to uh, make the younger conservationists interested in the fact or aware of the fact that disease does play a very big role in wildlife populations, modulating wildlife populations and you know driving their dynamics. Um, at not necessarily an apparent level, and a lot of like your work has shown, uh, just something as simple as a gut parasite could modulate the immune system of an animal or of the herd and make them more susceptible or less susceptible to an infectious disease that could potentially wipe them out. So, you know, uh, we don't necessarily have to go out and deworm them, but knowing that you know, they do have these parasites and then in case in future there is a bacteria or a virus that comes into the population, having that information available of what could potentially be the impact of these organisms on the population, given that mm -hmm. they have parasites. I think that's the kind right. of information. And that's what I would like to encourage our younger uh, you know, conservationists to keep in mind um, when they do, when they go out and work with wildlife populations is um, to also give a thought about uh, how parasites and potentially diseases could be impacting your uh, particular species of concern. So um, with that, yeah, I want to add to that. Can I add really quickly just that co-infections are the norm yeah. in the wild, right? Like, I think, especially when we have a human-centered kind of view of health, we tend to think of like one disease at a time, right? Like one infection at a time. Co-infections being infected with more than one thing at a time is, that's the usual in wildlife. And yeah. those different infectious agents interact with each other directly, indirectly, they interact through the immune system, they affect reproduction, they affect wildlife health, they affect grazing, they affect predation. And so just understanding that because I think also it's, you know, a lot of the disease literature also comes from lab animals, which is, you know, I think that's very important because lab animal studies let us go further and further in detail, right? About like how a disease works and interacts with an animal. But it's easy to kind of forget that that's not at all a natural system, right? There's no seasonality in labs. There's usually no co-infections in labs. You know, there's not like the, the same kind of stressors <laughs> in labs of like, oh, will we get water today? Are we eating enough? Like, was I just chased by a predator or, you know? And so it's really important to, Learn what you can about those infectious diseases from the lab studies, but then go and ground truth that out in actual populations that are, they're messy. The research is much more difficult oftentimes just to get samples <laughs> can be really hard. You know, there's a lot of variation, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It's really, really critical that we don't just look at say clonal lab mice. Right. I think that's a great point. Really cool. um, 
I think with that, we should uh, get to the Q&A because I'm sure the audience have some questions. Um, and if they don't, I do have lots of questions to ask you. Um, so, Vinny, shall we look at the questions? Or the, I'll just check my chat quickly. Okay, so here's a question from Abhijit saying, thank you for such a relevant talk by the distinguished scientists. I would like to know about cooperations between countries and respective institutions that changed after this pandemic while developing vaccines like sharing research data. Okay, not directly associated with the talk, but would you like to answer any of you? So I think we're still figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're asking about about whether the pandemic has changed uh, cooperation between countries. Yeah, yeah. 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 I hope so. <laughs> yeah. That's all I can say. It's ter It's a terrible problem. It's a terrible problem. This this uh, lack of transparency of data. Period. It's a terrible problem. It's like how to. You know, it's like protecting ignorance. <laughs> and I don't, I, I just, you fight it every time you turn around, but then again, you're trying to publish your paper and, you know, there's so many factors associated with that, but but the, the guarding of data, especially from governments, I think there's some ethical questions about that, um, that it's just not right, um, especially government. I mean, this is the government of the people you pay for it. You should have that information. Yeah. Um, and, and, and all the better the world for sharing that information. Uh, we yeah, have to be able to share. Oh. Just gonna, it's usually yeah. not the scientists who don't want to share the information. No. <laughs> sort of scientists are, you know, they're, they're say stonewalled by, yeah, the powers that be that are often not scientists. Oh, yeah because there's right. political and economic issues at stake. Right. But, but yeah, my hope is, I mean, the pandemic has already changed so much of our society. Like it's changed the way we work. It's changed mm -hmm. the, you know, it, it's changed the way we interact with each other. Um, and so, you know, maybe, yeah, is I'm hopeful, right? That there's maybe that benefit in a way of, it's going to change the way that we think about our global connectedness in terms of health and what we do share. And we all know that animals, yeah. you know, do, do not respect political boundaries. Yeah, so clearly, exactly. Exactly. the importance of sharing, it's, it can start at the community level sharing, but going all the way up to states and county states. And, you know, we need an ethic or a, uh, just a cultural appreciation of sharing mm -hmm. and transparency that needs to happen that that idea um okay. so that this isn't a fight every time every time something happens I'm, i mean yes it's very frustrating for for those of us scientists that are trying to understand things better that's all we're trying to do and and the fact that you can't get the data because somebody's hiding it somewhere um is just so aggravating but I think the and pandemic has helped in the sense that yes. it has fast-tracked a lot of the tech. Um, it has also brought into highlight yeah. the importance of diseases for yeah. some populations at least. Absolutely. And so even, even for me, like I've been trying to work on my lab diseases in India for the past 20 years. Um, and I would say it has gotten much easier in the past two years than it has ever been to actually have people listen to me. I wouldn't even get an audience yes. uh, yeah. with governments before this. Um, so now at least people don't laugh at me when I talk about it. They don't think I'm talking crazy. Um, you know, they still are not sure about funding, but they do uh, give importance to it. They do respect uh, yeah. what I'm trying to say. So I think that has changed definitely. And so I, I hope that um, soon the governments will realize that everything is interconnected. And so sharing information is very important if you want uh, your own populations also to be healthy and, you know, to, to be able to drive better health for everybody. Yeah. And, then, and if you talk about money, if, if you talk about money, isn't it more efficient if you all share your data than reproducing yeah, exactly. over and over again the same study? Yes. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Right. I was going to bring up, you know, social media can definitely have its yeah. drawbacks, right? Because you can spread a lot of misinformation with social media. But then at the same time, we're in a really interesting time as well where there's a lot of 
ability to share around typical yeah. boundaries mm -hmm. through things like social media. Um, and, and I think that that's, we're in an interesting place there and, and seeing where, where that can go. Because I mean, we've already seen like say, you know, grassroots political movements, you know, get around certain governmental boundaries through social media and, and mobilize citizens. And, you know, maybe, some, maybe we can do the same thing for, you know, population health monitoring that affects humans and wildlife and livestock and share more of that information that way through just like grassroots channels. Again, with caveats that like, you know, you, you have to weed out misinformation, but I feel like there's value in, you know, once you have a huge amount of data, you get to kind of start to see the trends, right? There's always gonna be some outliers where like, I don't think that's a real thing. But if there's enough people talking, reporting the same kind of issue, there's a signal there, right? Yeah. And so so maybe, maybe we're at a point where, yeah, we can actually do a lot more without official funding, right? And, and official like, okays to go ahead by some government entity. I yeah, I think ProMed, ProMed, which has been around since the 90s, exactly. um, is, is, is an old-fashioned social media uh, kind of resource for that. And it's, it's been incredible for my life. I can tell you right now, watching the H1N1, you know, uh, outbreak or, or even back in Hong Kong. And I mean, it was so exciting to be able to know these things were going on around the world, but, it, and it could be obviously more of those would be helpful and that's moderated so that's important yeah, that, yeah all and, of you should sign up for the promed email updates absolutely you can do it yeah. daily or weekly They're, it's so fantastic <laughs> you see the mapping uh, and the way they map the map the yeah. and the moving, movement of diseases in real time so that's really amazing to see and they're happy to take you know it's not just humans it's plants it's wildlife it's all kinds of animals, anything. Um, it's it's really been a, a, a very important uh, sort of framework in the background for One Health as, a, as an idea because it's wide open. Um, so yeah, everybody should sign up. Um, so the next question is uh, quite interesting. Do elephants get primary amoebic meningoencephalitis? Could this explain the madness followed by deaths in them? Uh, that's very specific. So I'm not sure. Um, Dr. Kaufman, would you like to answer that? Oh, I was hoping you would enlighten us. <laughs> what, can you repeat that? What's the disease there? Um, so I'm not sure I'm not exactly. Familiar. I'm not familiar with this either. I have never come across. Uh, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis in elephants. It's amoebic meningoencephalitis. Yes. Amoebic, right? Yes. Oh, amoebic. okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. Um, yeah. Sorry, I can't answer. You, you need to get out there on uh, and, and and Google that out to see if you can yeah, find I, any I'm papers. not aware of um, madness followed by death in elephants. So I think what you're talking about maybe could be, you know, um, uh, certain signs that elephants show potentially, I don't know, maybe. Um, Is this aggressive of, elephants? Are we, are we talking about aggressive elephants? That I am not sure. Um, okay. so I think the context is not very clear. Maybe if you want yeah. to, Ranjita, if you want to uh, elaborate a little bit, we can do that. We can talk about it. Okay. Uh, other question is, are there any instances where domestic animals have been vaccinated or treated for parasites have improved the overall health of a wildlife population, more so than just preventing disease transmission from domestic animals? This is from Holly. So, so let me, can I paraphrase the question to make sure I have it clear? So it, the question is, have, do we know how say vaccinating or deworming our domestic animals, especially live, uh, or big livestock flocks can affect wildlife health, That's right? Like for, for spillover type organisms. Yes. Yeah, I'd have to go to the literature. To, I'm sure people <laughs> have looked at that. I don't offhand remember any sp particular studies that I've looked at. I'm sure it's been looked at. And it, I mean, 
thinking about it, it there's makes ring sense. vaccination ring vaccination mm -hmm. campaigns yeah. 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 um that's that's pretty common now as a strategy right carrie yeah. Yeah. i don't know about yeah. vaccinating to anthrax have they have they have there been any instances where they vaccinated the livestock for anthrax and seen a decrease probably not because it's in the soil yeah, that, that's a tough one. Like, yeah, anything that's like soil transmitted, right. right, is a lot harder. And I mean, the anthrax vaccines aren't great either. They only confer immunity for about six months, it seems like, yeah. in most cases. And then, yeah, I think the issue is like the spores can remain viable in soil for decades, <laughs> centuries, right? So, so I think it, it also depends on the disease and it depends on the kind of transmission. So like you said, like if it's a an obvious like, viral spread that's fairly simple in spread and doesn't involve a lot of you need to control yeah doing something like ring vaccination is going to make more of an impact than if it's you know a complex say yeah vector um transmitted parasite yeah. Yeah. that then you know you have to control the infection both in your livestock but then you have to control the vector and the wildlife so, so the basic the basic concept of i mean i guess a disease ecologist would be helpful here um the concept of reducing disease burden in an ecosystem is that kind of what they're getting at i think right i think that's what is achievable that's what we achieve try to achieve uh, in managing wildlife health right because Total eradication or total prevention is not possible. It's just not something that's feasible either. Right. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, yeah. So it does, it depends on the disease. It depends on the oh. complexity of transmission. So something that's that's much simpler transmitted, which is typical, you know, like animal to animal, and that we have, say, a good vaccine for, that's something that you can think about by say vaccinating your livestock, you can decrease the disease burden in the population. You know, once you get to, again, like environmentally transmitted diseases, that's a lot harder because then you also have to treat the environment and that gets very sticky. And once you get vectors involved and then multiple vectors for a lot of parasites, that's a whole different situation. It's not impossible, you know, to sort of decrease disease burden, but it's a lot more difficult. I mean, that's, you know, there's a reason that smallpox is the only, you know, human disease we've eradicated so far, right? Because pretty simple transmission, very simple disease. Um, you know, other things like malaria, you know, it's much more complex. There, there's whole environmental and vector factors and, you know, reservoirs and, yeah. But the point is that the whole point of managing any kind of disease, but especially wildlife diseases, as Dr. Kaufman said, to make sure that we reduce the burden of disease in the population and you know try to achieve a kind of herd immunity and you would have some dioxin, you would have some animals that are still affected but the rest of the population most of the population is still protected and so that's the target for most wildlife health programs and I, I think the other thing that, that carrie's brought up multiple times too is is that there's interaction <laughs> so so Thinking about eradicating a single disease is, is not practical or even doesn't make sense because there are interactions with other pathogens, other organisms, environmental conditions that um, would make that probably impossible. And the threshold maybe shouldn't be eradication, it just should be health Correct. Uh, and population health and to allow allow some disease to occur, of course it's going to, it's part of being alive, um, and, and, and uh, understanding the complexity there is really important, yeah. Um, so, I, I think we're pretty close to our time, so I'll take, I think, one more, uh, which I think is very interesting. Are invertebrates more susceptible to diseases than vertebrates? How and why? The question was, are, in, are invertebrates more susceptible to disease than vertebrates? I don't know that we necessarily know because invertebrates no, no, no. have been very understudied in terms of, yeah. in terms of their health. <laughs> you know, invertebrates are, have been studied a lot for, you know, the population level for like 
oh, what are they doing for pollination, right? Things like that, or how are they acting as disease vectors <laughs> for, you know, these diseases? But in terms of, you know, how diseases actually are in like affecting invertebrate populations, I think we're still kind of at the cusp of that. I think we're probably, we probably have done more research with marine <laughs> invertebrates in terms of health and, and diseases and population health than mm -hmm. land and invertebrates for sure. So I don't know that anyone can answer that question yet because yeah, like it's like we've studied vertebrates this much and invertebrate health this much. So and also the number yeah. of vertebrates versus invertebrates, right? I mean, how would they even cover the breadth of invertebrates that you have compared to the vertebrates? So just the number of species that we're talking about, the tax, uh, I mean, the different genera, and so I don't, I don't know how how one would answer that. Yeah, and 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 the perspective on on the natural response to disease or what or whatever in populations if we think you know they have the incredible potential to reproduce in very very large numbers well maybe that's in reaction to susceptibility to other factors it's it's all very dynamic um so i don't even know if the answer to that question is that relevant to what's going on. I mean, are you, you would need to look at it in the context of the life of the invertebrates or of the population, especially. I think if it was apparent, like in the bees, uh, then yes, you would probably know what's happening, but a lot of times it's not apparent and you don't even know something is happening, so. Oh yeah, bees, yeah, of course, there's some important species um, that you, butterflies, bees, things that we, we decide are important. Yes. <laughs> exactly, so it's a perspective. Right, and their own, that are more well studied, but to generalize would be very difficult. Um, so another question is, what about the major differences and difficulties in managing wild animal health in captive and free ranging? Um, I think, Dr. Kaufman, do you want to take that quickly? Um, Many differences. In, in fact, if you look at populations of animals that are captive and free ranging, uh, you know, look at elephants, for example, uh, there are more diseases that elephants or, or health issues that elephants have in captivity are related to their captivity. So having an elephant, having a wild animal living in captivity um, generally endangers their health more than living in the wild. Even though the wild is a scary and dangerous place, um, I think uh, certainly the diseases that we end up responding to in a zoo setting or whatnot, many, 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 if not most of them, I think most of them are because of being in captivity. You know, they're physical or uh, nutritional or uh, lack of environmental stimulation or there are all kinds of things um, that are directly related to being in captivity. Um, I, I, to that, I would say, you know, as someone who's advocated for parasite conservation, <laughs> right, as sort of important parts of ecosystems and host health, I yes. think it's so interesting that our, our modus operandi of critically endangered species has often been, you know, take the last remaining animals out of the yeah. wild, yeah. into zoos and wildlife centers, which, you know, that, that makes sense to some degree because we want to try captive breeding with eventual hope for re-release. But typically what happens in those situations is that those animals are completely like dewormed. <laughs> they're, you know, like they're treated for everything under the sun, yeah. which, you know, I, I don't know how good of an idea that is because the thing is, again, they've co-evolved, especially with like long-term interactions, like their gut parasites, like, can potentially live for years in their systems. They've co-evolved with those for thousands of years. And then suddenly you're, you know, taking this sort of small founder population out, hoping to resurrect the species and then put them out in the wild without sort of any of the usual disease pressures or that co-evolution. And you're, you're not preserving kind of those interactions. And I don't necessarily know what the answer is there, <laughs> like what the how, the, how to best do that. But I think we have to start rethinking how we do, you know, how we treat our, you know, zoo species. Cause a lot of times, yeah, we use them for captive breeding and hopefully 
will re-release. But yeah, we're, we're literally changing sort of the course of evolution <laughs> and interaction with their ecosystems once we take them out. That, you know, that being said, I, there is value. You know, there's value on both sides. We obviously we learn a tremendous amount when we can observe them so closely. Mm -hmm. The other thing is not to assume that free living wildlife are living in paradise. And, and we have impacted that greatly. I mean, you just look at climate change. So even animals that we think are better off because they're in the wild, that doesn't mean we're not messing that up and causing problems there. Um, so that that's and and that that sounds simple, but it, it is kind of commonly com commonly held, you know, that there is this pristine environment that they're doing great in. It's like no, not really. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to that question of context. So if yes. if it's important that's to bring nice. wild animals into captivity because it's it's that's the only way to save them, then yes. And then you go into intensive management, health management, as Dr. Kaufman pointed out. But if it's not really necessary, then it's better to just let them be in the wild where you don't necessarily have to intervene at every point, uh, only to make sure that they're healthy and they can, uh, they have you know, a lower burden of disease as again was pointed out earlier in the talk. Um, another question is, um, so I am Alok Kumar, a budding wildlife biologist. I have a question regarding wildlife trade, how it impacts wildlife health as wildlife trade has been demonstrated as a main factor in global spread of the fungus. I'm guessing he's talking about tetrid fungus. So, mm -hmm. so how wildlife trade affects wildlife health? Ah, badly in every respect. <laughs> it's bad, just bad. I, I, the examples are innumerable. That's where the pandemic came from. So, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's not only, a risk for disease emergence and spread to places where, you know, frogs from, you know, the United States going to South America or whatever, but it's, it's also, um, <clears throat> it, it's completely inhumane. And, and not to mention, like that's where most of our invasives come from, like not necessarily yes. wild, but like, things that Ecosystem. go on the wildlife. <laughs> and you know that's why like we have 80s Egypti mosquitoes now in parts of yep. the southern U.S. and you know so so yeah it's their wildlife trade in general yeah like you said I mean, at the base of it it's inhumane and just not necessary <laughs> um and then you know, if we have to talk purely about like, hey, what it's doing for human health, <laughs> you know, if we have to put in economics, it's like, yeah, like that's, that makes, whenever you create another wildlife urban interface or a wildlife livestock human interface, that makes the perfect exactly. mixing pot for exactly. these diseases, especially viruses. They do the, this, do this the best because they can mutate so quickly to jump host, to evolve, to be able to become more virulent, to go into humans, livestock. And so the wildlife trade in particular really facilitates that. Um, I think and I would then, say not just illegal wildlife trade, but also exotic pet trade. So it's not just the illegal. Legal wildlife. and illegal. It's just yeah. not good. Um, I think the last question is regarding invasive methods of monitoring wildlife, which are in trend, for example, radio collars. But due to lack of awareness and carelessness, wildlife is facing a big setback in terms of conservation. Few recent incidents tell that it is really problematic for their health and sometimes has been proven to be fatal for animals. So I'm thinking they're asking if radio coloring is fatal or problematic for animal health. Um, it varies with the species. I mean, any, I mean, it brings up an important point that any type of research being conducted on wildlife needs to be fully evaluated for the animal welfare um, aspects. And it hasn't always been. Um, so that's a point of vigilance that we really need to, to up the ante on. It's very, very important um, to make sure that, that any devices, whether it's a collar or implant, or there's been issues with implants, um, 
is fully evaluated before you know it's adopted just whole hog like it has been. In some cases, um, the collars are, are I, I believe, I don't have a lot of experience in it, are, are fine um, and closely monitored and uh, you know fall off at certain points and and want to and provide unbelievable information. Um, yes, I have I have a decent amount of experience with collaring, um, and and with like bird backpacks and things like that. And in my experience, and in my experience working with you know my network of colleagues and understanding what they've done with collaring things, I have not seen an adverse effect. Um, that's not to say that it can't happen, but I have not seen an adverse effect in any of the animals that I worked with or did animal capture on, which involves, you know, darting and, you know, taking samples and then waking them up. Um, none of the hundreds of animals that I've captured died um, during the course of our study. Um, the collars, the, the main issue we had with collars that we, we learned early on was to not bother collaring male zebras because they just, they go up to each other and fight and they bite the collars off of each other. <laughs> and it's, it's, like, it's like, it's a, it's a thing to like grab the other one, but then the, they bite it off in like 20 minutes and you've lost a collar. And so that's like the level of annoyance I've seen. So that's not to say that, you know, things can't go wrong for sure. And, but you know, there's been a lot of studies with like stress that's hormones. Main point I, I think it, it hasn't shown in a, in most cases that that these things have been adverse in terms of stress. And I should say, as technology is getting better, yeah, things are getting smaller, smaller. smaller, and we're able to like do monitoring from like satellites and stuff. So I think things are just going to get better in terms of wildlife monitoring. Yes, and I think there are two points here that uh, could potentially lead to uh, problems for animals. Is like. Uh, it, as Dr. Gretchen pointed out, that um, it's operator thing also. So you need to know how to use uh, radio collars, how to put them on, and not just use it because it's a trend, but it actually has to be justified for your study that it really will serve a purpose. And you should have trained people putting on those collars. Uh, and B, I think, is to keep in mind the biology of the species itself. So if you're yep. putting on collars on, say, like as Dr. Sazowski has pointed out, in male zebras, but they're potentially going to you know, bite each other and try to get the collar off and then lead to injuries and stuff like that. You might want to be considered uh, collaring in those kind of animals. So I think this is something that uh, your research has to guide you and uh, a lot of this is avoidable and not necessarily because of radio collars, but because of operator or research, researcher issues. So- and I, and I should say that that every, every animal we collared and captured, like we took, every sample possible within, you know, usually a 10 minute window, you know, so, so yeah, we, we had a very strict plan with our team who was in charge of what, who was in charge of monitoring the animal. And yeah, like in that kind of invasive scenario, we took every kind of, you know, data point that we could, because if you're going to do, you know, if you're, if you have an animal down in front of you, yeah, like it benefited like 10 research projects, right? And once, and then you have the collars on and you can continue to do movement studies and, you know, maybe non-invasively resample those animals later, like sample feces and things. And, and so I think that's an important consideration. Like the more invasive you get, try to get more and more data and get more collaborators involved. Make yeah. it worth it. Absolutely. I think with that, we should wind up because we're way over time. I'm, I'm really sorry about, uh, I, I know it's really late for both of you and uh, I really appreciate mm -hmm. this. Uh, I think no, no, it's early for us. It's late for you. It's early. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's really been a great, great uh, session. And I hope our young conservationists also, our audience has also learned a lot from this. And I thank you very much once again for your time. And, Look forward to interacting with both of you more in the future. Great. Thank you for inviting, inviting Thank me. You. Thank you. This was fun. Good luck to everybody. Thank you.